And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers into the temple, coming to us from the double-headed monster that is Dice Knight Games and the developers of Final Horizon. In the red corner, Daniel Knight, and in the blue corner, Spencer Barrett. We're not going to have them box yet. Mostly because we do hockey yeah. fights around here. <laughs> How you two hey, doing tonight? Thanks for having wow. us. Yeah, wonderful to be here. Uh, was not expecting that uh, entrance, but uh, yeah, thank you. I do think I do things a little differently around here. Uh, it's wonderful. Oh. Let's get started. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings of a sort. Um, I'd like both of you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, Spence, do you mind if I go first on this one? Please, take the lead. Okay, so um, my... Oldest brother is seven years older than I am. I'm 32. So uh, he was at the very beginning of, of role-playing games, kind of picking up into their height, uh, especially on console. Uh, so as a little, little child, uh, I was absolutely obsessed with Final Fantasy I. Um, I would watch him play it all the time. I was just completely engrossed in it. And uh, my, my oldest friend, Zach Williams, who, who was my childhood friend, we used to play Legos. And my first real tabletop experience was simply just being kids uh, playing Legos with my buddies. And if we were at my house, I was running the game. If we were at his house, he was running the game. And we had no dice or anything. Everything was just discretion. Uh, and we were just recreating that Final Fantasy I uh, with our toys and stuff, and it just really led to years and years of, of creative role play with each other, and, and uh, that always stuck with me that my very first game wasn't even anything that actually had any... Uh, it, it wasn't actually a game. It was just childhood pretend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so uh, as for me, when I was in college, I started, uh, I, I found a couple different D&D &D groups that never really fit well with me. And then the first game that I really fell in love with was uh, Stars Without Number. And I had a hard time finding people who would run the game for me, of course. And I was so enchanted with it that I was like, all right, well, I've never GM'd before, but I'll, I'll do it. And uh I've actually ran several games for that. One of them was for Danny, right? Yes. And uh, I just have a lot of success with that, and I love that game specifically. Um, and then I moved on to, like, the Genesis um, and some other really interesting RPGs. But I am not really the biggest person for, uh, like, Pathfinder and D&D, though it I just have a little bit of trouble with them that I could never get past, but they're wonderful games. Mm -hmm. Now, would it be fair of me to say that you guys have hopped around between games over over the years? Um, yeah, I would say hopped around is the is it a good term or good way to describe it. Uh, a few games have stuck in particular. I'm a big D and D nut uh, and Call of Cthulhu. Um, but other than that, yeah, a lot of experimenting, but not a ton of long time gaming in a lot of systems. And for me, uh, I've probably been in the RPG world for about 10 years, but I try and play just about everything I can get my hands on. Um, even things like masks, like, uh, I love the, that system. It's a lot of fun where, uh, it's yeah, just creating the story on the fly um, the dice work differently in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very innovative system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've talked about masks, and 
one of the, and one of the and one of the other games that um, that studio ca came out with that I was a little harsh with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, that being a that being Avatar Legends. <laughs> it was that for Avatar: The Last Airbender. Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's a that's a high bar to hit. Yeah, they did. They ha doing TTRPGs based on Avatar are not new. This was just the first one that had the official name stamped on it. Um, but I, I co I covered it a while back, and I ha I had some issues with how it was set up. Um, along with a really bad explanation as to why. They didn't make a. They didn't make um, avatars playable. Their argument was some things should remain mysterious, which I thought was a bit of a reach. But with the, with that in mind, were you did you guys have more of a leaning towards space opera given given um, Final Horizon? Talk to me about the journey between just being enthusiasts to being designers. Uh, yes, so we actually, our first embodiment of this system, the, our, our rule set, uh, was actually fantasy, and it was called Final Dungeon, uh, and uh, stylized together with no space. That was actually a head nod to Final Fantasy and Dungeons and Dragons, which were obviously our big two influences. Mm -hmm. um, but whenever we decided we wanted to actually go through with illustrating and laying out and creating uh, a real game and not just something that we were sharing amongst our friends. Uh, I decided to go with sci-fi because not only am I, yes, an absolute sucker for space opera in general, uh, but I feel like sci-fi is truly kind of a limitless genre where anything can be done and justified with some degree of science or future tech. Uh, and it, it, it really actually appeals to the way our game plays mechanically, which is much more narrative and with a lot of player agency. So, uh, yes, sci-fi we really thought could stretch its legs uh, with this rule set that we have. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So... The smart ass in me wants to say so you jumped from Final Fantasy over to over to Fantasy Star. I um, haven't actually played Fantasy Star. I have and uh you know you know that's a that's a good head nod. <laughs> I I love Fantasy Star online. So I I'd flipped a coin whether or not it was going to reference Fantasy Star or Star Ocean and the coin came up heads. Uh, well, you know what? I honestly enjoy both of them. So, Star Ocean till the end of time for the PS2 was I spent many hours in that game. Mm -hmm. Um, although I do recall I do recall ranting for several minutes over the over the fact that they called one of the bosses Crystal Cerberus, and it only has one head. Oh no! I don't even know the context, and that makes me upset. Oh. Uh, <laughs> One of the one of the bosses was I just explained the context. One of the bosses was named Crystal Cerberus. It's a dog. It's a crystalline dog, but it only has one head, and that. Yeah, no, that's that's yeah. I don't like. Oh, uh, I ch I chalk it up to thro to throwing in words because they sound cool, which is something you're going to see a lot when dealing with console RPGs. Yes. Oh. Uh. I mean, if I mean, if we're gonna go, that, if we're gonna go uh, down that route, then we'd have to we'd have to examine the question about why Shiva in in the Final Fantasy series is a woman. Oh yeah, no, I'm talk. You're talking to a Hindu. I I definitely have always found that one a bit of a weird, <laughs> My weird theory, trope. Right? I've had I've had a theory for a while. Call it crackpot, if you will, but I can't help but wonder if, um. If she, if that, if the, the not the naming mm -hmm. after and F was that Shiva was not supposed to be named after the Hindu creator destroyer god, but rather 
it was supposed to be um, Shiver, which is an ice nymph that you see in um, that you see in English folklore, and ah. trans- and somebody screwed up on translation. Well, that would definitely make sense. Because I could I could see sh- I could see Shiver um, yeah. sounding li- sounding like Shiva if you put if you put it through a, if you put it through a Japanese accent. Yeah, I don't have any proof that's what actually happened, but given how translation into English was a work in progress in those days, I could see it. Yeah, no, I definitely could see it. Oh. After Earthbound, you never know. Um, plus, plus, the, plus. Let's not forget the fact that with the original Final Fantasy, everybody had to be four letter names because of character limitations. Oh yeah, yep. Your times. Uh, so, get so getting it, getting into that. Now, as I rec- now as I'm aware, you've referred to Final Horizon as a bit as a bit of a. A, as a light rule set, so I'd like to first go into what the into the core mechanic, i.e., the all roads lead to Rome. Um, is from what I'm if I'm reading this right, you guys are doing a you guys did a roll under system. Uh, no, well, I no, it functions the same way as a roll under system, like how Call of Cthulhu does. Um, but we actually are doing a roll over. And the reason for that, for that little extra step Mm -hmm. is because whenever, uh, characters are rolling against each other, uh, it is directly opposed. I'm going to, if I want to hit you with the pipe, I'm going to roll, uh, plus my strength and you are going to roll plus your body and whoever has the, the higher result is the victor. So rather than split the rule set in half and say, look, if you're just trying to accomplish tasks, it's this way. If you're trying to do something versus someone else, it's that way. We just put them both on the same thing and did it roll over uh, a cumulative for your thing. Whenever you're uh, accomplishing just mundane skill rolls and things, that's a static threshold of 10 to pass. Mm-hmm. So you're rolling 1d10 and adding your stat trying to be above 10. And basically, if it, uh, I won't go too far, uh, what that does is that means that not considering critical roles, uh, that each point in a stat that you do, uh, with 10 being the max, gives you a 10% chance of success. So it really makes it uh, easy to assess your character's abilities at a glance. Uh, if you see you have seven points in tech, then you know that you have a 70% chance to hack this computer. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Now, since you mentioned criticals, I want to ask about that cuz uh-huh. it would be easy to assume that it that a critical is or is a natural 10, which means there's a 10% chance to crit. Um but I get the feeling that's not entirely the case here. No, it's it's not. Um and so we actually have a critical confirmation system. Um I know some people think that that might uh, slow things down. Um, but what we tell people to do is you just always roll a fate die, as we call it, with your standard die. So whenever you're rolling to do uh, anything from hack that computer to hit someone, you're rolling your D10 as well as your D20. Mm-hmm. Um, the way this works is whenever you get a 10 or a 1, uh, you are triggering a critical. So you then refer to your fate die, which is 1d20 plus your fate stat, uh, and the, the GM rolls 1d20. If your fate roll is higher than that on a 10, you have a crit pass, uh, and if it is uh, lower than that for a uh, uh, 1, then you have a crit fail. Now, uh, this actually raises what we have a critical uh, currency system we call morale. Uh, critical passes, raise your morale, uh, and critical fails, lower your morale. Uh, your morale has basically passive buffs and debuffs that you can stack, 
uh, to you can accumulate over time to employ these passive buffs, or you can spend it like currency uh, all the way down to zero, uh, choosing to take some really nasty debuffs if you were to do that. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, the appeal to this we really like is that uh, how you build your character on their stats uh, affect how often you get your critical passes, how uh, often you get your critical fails, and how often you can take advantage of the morale system. Mm-hmm. Now, would would morale be akin to a momentum system, or is it a resource that can be spent to give a boost? Um, it, you, are you I, want to take this one, Danny? Yeah, go for it. You know Star Trek. Sure. So, um, yeah, I've actually, I have played some Star Trek adventures, um, and the morale system in there, or the momentum system in that is a little bit different. In Final Horizon, morale is actually tied to your class that you choose, and they all have different effects. Um, so here, let me go to one, actually, real quick. Uh, like, well, for the soldier, just a, a frontline soldier who might be good with both swords and guns, their morale ability actually just allows them to heal some health outright so they can keep on fighting. Uh, they're meant to be a frontliner in that regard. They're a tank class. Yes. Whereas, um, warriors who kind of represent a berserker, their stat bonus is to strength. Their morale ability allows them to add damage uh, equal to 1d6 per morale spent. So just bonus damage on top. Uh, spies can get additional movement. So you can really kind of choose to take debuffs or if you spend the morale or keep them accumulated and get the uh, like passive damage and passive movement bonuses that morale provides. Yeah, my personal favorite there is for the Diplomat, which is the Charisma-based class. Their morale ability is actually to raise or lower another character's morale uh, based on the number they spend. So you can be either recovering your allies from their critical fails or uh, debuffing enemies in the middle of combat to to give them debuffs as well. And speaking of which, I'd like to go into a little bit of the classes because I do find it interesting that you have um, a, that you have a class to represent each of the um, core attributes. Yes, um, I'm gonna. I'm not trying to cut you off, but that's actually a motif you'll find throughout the entire game. The eight stats are archetypical. Uh, there, so there will be eight status effects. There will be eight classes. Uh, eight vessel types, eight allies, they all uh, tie into those eight archetypes. So carry on. All roads point to Rome, you said, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, all, I, use, I use the phrase all roads lead to Rome to refer to a a, a approach to how, to how die mechanics work and have worked for a while, have worked for a while. Essentially, there, essentially there's one particular resolution method that everything builds around in something like say Shadowrun it's all about that d6 pool in uh, in something like World of Darkness it's all about that d it's all about that d10 pool um mm-hmm. in some and something like um Legend of the Five Rings it's all about the roll and keep approach and so so on and so, so on and so forth you contrast yeah, that see. with with or with say um, early versions of D and D where you had you had Thaco, you had you had um ro- you had rolling high for damage, you had rolling lo- you had rolling low for attacks and for and for skills, and you'd have a bunch of different subsystems instead of a unified front. Gotcha. Yeah, I've uh, fortunately I came into. D and D after a lot of what I hear the horror stories of early D and D was. Oh. I'd less I'd I'd consider them less horror stories and more teething troubles. Just just ones that stuck around because some because some people thought that there was some 
brilliant vision that Gygax and Arneson had when really they were just a couple guys who who put in stuff that they liked. Yeah. But you were asking about the classes originally. Yeah, I'd like to go. Th I'd like to go through each of them from top to bottom, and okay, what and what that particular class brings to the brings to the proverbial table. Okay, would you like me to start off and go through? Yeah, I'll start. We'll start off with warrior. Okay, so our warrior is obviously going to be your damage class uh, for particularly for melee. Um, their abilities focus on melee, and they are going to be, uh, like I said, your primary damage dealing class as far as uh, damage die as a baseline is tied to your class in this game. So they have the highest damage die uh, tied to them for their melee. Um, they get their natural stat bonus to their strength stat, their primary ability, which all classes, uh, have an active and a passive ability is that when they're grappling or pushing, uh, they may spend, spend their skill points to deal damage, which normally those actions are, uh, don't deal damage They're tactical actions. So they add damage to their tactical actions. Um, and their passive ability is, is one of my favorites uh, in that whenever they make attack rolls against their opponent, uh, the difference between the attacker and defender's roll goes to their damage roll. So if I roll a, a 10 to hit you and you roll a 5 to defend, then I'm instantly adding 5 to my damage. And that just kind of plays into them being the berserker uh, kind of class. Uh, like Spencer said, their morale ability is that they just add flat damage. Uh, that's for for their archetype. Adding straight damage is what they do for their morale. Yeah. So next, next would be Soldier. So Soldier is going to be your... Uh, it's a more versatile fighter. It's a tankier fighter. It gets its bonus to body. Uh, it has a it has more doubt uh, balance between its melee and projectile damage dice. Uh, the active ability is very straightforward. It's uh, to spend skill points for additional attacks equal to one per spent. So this is your your character that you can kind of like how the monk uh, in D and D was built to have several several attacks on their turn based on their skill points. Uh, their passive ability is that they win ties, uh, which normally the standard rule with all ties is that they go to the defender. Mm -hmm. uh, soldiers win ties, and they also gain morale uh, from winning ties in and out of combat. So they are the only class that actually has another method of gaining morale. Like Spencer also said, their, their morale ability is to gain uh, health points, 1d10 health points per morale spent, uh, instantly, and that doesn't take an action. Mm -hmm. So, next on the list would be the Spy. The Spy is our mobility and utility character. Uh, they're completely balanced between their damage, uh, or their melee and projectile damage uh, right in the middle, dead set right, uh, in the middle. They get their bonus to their agility, and their uh, active ability is that they may spend their skill points to take additional actions. Mm -hmm. uh, they you can't repeat the same action uh, as, and by that I mean you can't do this to do like how the soldier makes several consecutive attacks, uh, but you can make unique actions per skill point. So I could uh, use a skill point to sprint and double my movement uh, then spend a skill point to make an attack on someone then spend a skill point to use the block action and spend a skill point to take a med kit and heal all on one turn with the spy so they're about uh, utility and versatility being able to do whatever they need to uh, and, and they have the highest action economy yeah. they're uh, 
Yes, their their passive ability is that they have advantage uh, when rolling agility to dodge. Uh, so basically, not only do they have that uh, action economy, but you if you use your action economy for the dodge at any point, you have advantage. Um, like Spencer said, this, their morale ability is that they spend morale to take additional movement, uh, which is handy for this class because... We don't split movement in this game. By that I mean you can't, uh, if you have 10 movement, you can't move 5, use an action, and then move 5. You have to designate your movement phase and your action phase. So for them, they're the only class that's able to use their movement and then uh, spend morale to take additional movement after acting. So, Want me to take hacker since I've yep. played hacker? Next? Yeah, you're a big hacker. Go for it. Sure. So I had a really fun insectoid hacker. Um, and so they get a bonus to technology, which that is a useful skill for uh, hacking cameras, searching things. Like the technology skill can't be undervalued, in my opinion. Uh, so they don't have a lot of melee damage, so of course it's good to stick to projectile with their 1d4 melee, 1d6 projectile. Um, however, their active ability, Hack, allows you to spend a skill point and either buff an ally or debuff an enemy equal to 1d6. So uh, yeah, if they had like 3 points and you roll a 6, then they're, they're already at a negative 3 for whatever they're rolling. Uh, they get a their passive ability. They roll advantage with advantage to identify and use items, uh, as well as combining items and weapons. Uh, they don't get a bonus to using. Well, hold on, not including weapons. So they uh, status effect weapons use tech the technology skill to activate their effect, and so they don't get a advantage to that, but still very useful. Um, their morale ability allows them to just change the result of a, a hack buff or debuff to six flat out. So, so they're, they're um, as a D and D nut, I kind of say they're uh, most akin to like your bard, where they are a buff and debuff playmaker. Uh, I mean, I know bards are more versatile than that, but down at their inspiration level and stuff, they're all about setting up. Uh, allies or or uh, putting enemies in in negative situations that hinder their ability to succeed. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So next, of course, would be the physician. Yeah, and if physicians, you know, they're uh, pretty much what you would expect. They're uh, low damage. Uh, they get their bonus to their mind stat. Their active ability um, allows them to basically spend skill points to heal other characters at a range. Uh, they have an innate ability that allows them to roll mind uh, to heal an adjacent character. But if they spend skill points, they can do this at a range um, without having to roll. Uh, their passive ability is that they roll with advantage when they are removing status effects, in particular things like infected, ensnared, surprised, uh, KO'd. So uh, they are uh, particularly effective at recovering your allies from status effects. Uh, their morale ability is that um, they can add their mind stat to the results of their healing roll. Mm. So it's basically just a an instantaneous buff to any heal rolls that they do. All right, I got that. So next, one that is going to be infamous to anybody who's played who's played them in, in certain fantasy games, the Psionic. Yes, okay, so the Psionic is a... I am a... This is a soft spot for me. Um, the Psionic, the way we do Psionics in this game, we don't have a spell list or anything like that uh, because... Again, we are trying to create a streamlined uh, game that's that's about being black and white, and 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 not about having these massive uh, these massive lists of things that you have to like keep track of and learn as you go along. Uh, the way we do this is that psionics 
uh, roll with their psionics stat uh, to hit people instead of their standard stat. What I mean by that is, if I were trying to shoot you with a laser pistol, that would be my agility versus your bod. Uh, bod is the, generally the defense stat to uh, withstand attacks in general. But whenever psionics attack people, they're rolling psionics versus psionics. So in general, your psionics are going to be particularly effective uh, against characters that are built to be more tanky uh, or more combat-oriented uh, because they're far less likely to have uh, invested in psionics themselves. Um, this basically means that your psionics are kind of like a sideways attacker, where if you have a, a primary aggressor and a primary defender locking up with each other, uh, both of them trying to chip the other down, a psionic can come in and, and easily just hit either one of them uh, by attacking a stat that they aren't readily equipped to defend with. Uh, the other thing is that psionic attacks not only cause... Uh, damage, but they also cause energy loss. Uh, energy is a secondary spec determined by your size stat, and uh, if that depletes before your hit points, you get sapped. Sapped is uh, a, a, akin to being KO'd uh, in that you're alive, uh, but you are sapped of your energy, so you're incapacitated. Um, so, and because your psionic stat uh, determines your energy, a lot of times your, your more aggressive or your more physical characters will not have uh, a very big reservoir of energy, so psionics are very easy to come in and quickly sap uh, characters that are not equipped to defend against them. Mm -hmm. So that's their primary ability, is that they spend skill points to make uh, a beefed-up psionic attack. They do have a baseline psionic attack that doesn't take uh, skill points. Their passive ability is that anytime they roll a natural 10, regardless of it being a crit or not, they gain a skill point. Uh, and their morale ability is that they can spend morale to deal additional energy loss, not damage, but energy in particular. So they can dump their morale to sap people more quickly. So, and real quick, Danny, you did mention uh, sapped, and then we already kind of covered the... Uh physician being able to recover KO status better, or the advantage. Okay. Uh, I think we have a really fun KO in depth system. Would you uh, mind, mind saying, mentioning that? Oh yeah, so the way death works for us, uh, KO is whenever your HP is brought to zero. Uh, so if I have 10 HP, I get hit for 12, my HP has been brought to zero, I'm now KO'd. Uh, I can still be recovered, I can still re recover on my own, or I can be destroyed uh, afterwards by another character. At any point, uh, if, if a character is destroyed or to be destroyed, at any point if a character takes double their current hit points in damage, they are destroyed. So if I were uh, to be, have 10 HP, I take 12 damage, I'm KO'd. But if I have 10 HP... I take 6 damage and have 4 HP, and then on my next turn I take 8 damage, I am destroyed outright. So because of that, it really creates this, uh, as your HP gets lower, you have to be much more tactical and considerate of what you can and can't take, because if you have 20 HP, you're, you're like, yeah, it's possible someone could reduce me to 20, but impossible that anyone will double that in a turn. However, if I have 5 HP, I have to be very, very considerate of what classes and what items and things are on the field, because if I take 10 damage, my character is permanently destroyed. Mm -hmm. So next on, next on the list that I have is the Diplomat. Yes, Diplomat is... Uh, a very tactical class. Uh, I'm a big fan of this guy, too. This is a soft spot for me. Uh, they are one of the weaker classes as far as their damage, obviously. Uh, they get their bonus to charisma. Uh, they are... Here's their active ability, is that they spend their skill points to command uh, friendly characters within line of sight to use one of several actions. You can use dodge, block, 
push, defend, or use an item, even if that character has already acted in the turn cycle. So uh, they're very situational. They're very playmaker, uh, or they are a playmaker. Uh, if your uh, warrior is taking down a, a difficult enemy, then you know you're commanding him to make his attacks. Uh, if your physician is trying to recover someone from the brink and they fail, then you're commanding them to use an item. Anything that is needed, they really kind of turn all of your allies into uh, pieces for you to use, almost like you're, you're uh, in, a t in a console tactical game. Their passive is that they have uh, advantage when rolling charisma to barter. Uh, in all barter roles, we have barter mechanics. Um, and like I said earlier, their morale ability is that they can raise another character's morale uh, or lower it based on what they spend. Mm -hmm. and so the, after... Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, the last of the classes I was going to ask about was Drifter. Yes. The Drifter is our fate-based class. Uh, they are average in their damage. They get their bonus to fate. Uh, their active ability allows them to uh, roll with advantage uh, on a stat or target roll. Uh, so if you have any roll you're doing, whether that be a skill roll to hack a computer or to attack an enemy, you can spend a skill point to make it with advantage. Uh, their Passive ability is particularly good for crit farming, as I call it, that they trigger criticals on nines as well as tens. Mm -hmm. uh, and their passive or their morale ability is that retroactively they can spend morale to lower the uh, passing threshold of a roll by one per spent. So if I roll and land directly on 10, I could spend one morale. Uh, to lower the threshold and pass. Or if I have an enemy that rolls two above me, I can spend two morale right there to tie us, and uh, the tie would go to me as a defender. Mm -hmm. Now, wow since, card. Since you mentioned um, a bit, of, a bit of the perks of being a hacker earlier, I do want to touch on that because sure in. In a lot of game, in a lot of games, and in a lot of systems, hacking is one of those things that some that some that some designers even have trouble with. Even the pros uh, have d have difficulty with it. So, I think I think one of the things that I that I'd, a that I'd ask first is, in your system, is is hacking is hacking how. How far in are the mechanics with hacking? Is it a, is it a a simple set of rules or is it far more in depth? Well, uh, I'll tell you. Just as a rule, we're always going to be going on the side of simple. Um, we do not have dedicated hacking mechanics. Uh, to explain this, what I'll do is I'll just explain how the stat rolling works in general. Um, we don't have dedicated skill trees, uh, so you're not going to have a tree that says tack hacking or uh, technology covers hacking. It covers that. Uh, what we do is everything is done intuitively based on the stat that is most appropriate to do it. So the way that we would handle hacking in general is a player would either ask if something is uh, possible to do via hacking or the GM would call on them to, uh, if they were trying to hack, to make a tech roll. If they pass their tech roll, then they accomplish it. And in general, it's as simple as that. If I want to uh, break down a door, if I roll my strength and pass, I've broken it down. If, uh, and, and the same, like I said earlier, we have no list for spells. So that applies to your psionic abilities as well. This is very intuitive based on uh, the GM's discretion and the player's uh, autonomy. So if someone says, I would like to read this guy's mind, uh, the GM might say, yeah, absolutely, roll me psionics. And if you pass, you can read his mind. Or if you want to sense for danger, 
Uh, so we don't have a list of spells or a list of hacking uh, abilities. It's much more uh, boiled down to that as far as roll psionics to use your psionics or roll technology to use technology. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, even with that, I know that I know that within the class entries there were example morale abilities. Um, when it comes to examples for using psionics or or using um, hacking, I'm guessing that the full book will have a similar kind of setup with examples. Um, it, 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 I'm sorry, as far as, oh, uh, the examples given? Uh, yeah, no, in the very back, we also have a list of common roles and stuff, uh, but basically it's explained to the players uh, how the rolling system works and that rather than having a list uh, that it's more intuitive. Now, we do, like I said, in the back, have an entire list of what we call the common roles, and this will go so far as to give lots of examples. Um, like if you were to go to the psionic section in there, you'll see read emotions, sense other life forms, uh, sense deception, things like that. And it all points you to rolling psionics above 10. Mm. Uh, but that's, that's what I would say the extent of it is the common roles table, which is really just a walkthrough of what we most commonly use all of those stats for. And that should give you the idea, along with uh, our description of how it works, uh, to, to figure out how to intuitively make those decisions for yourself. We, we've noticed even for players that have never played role-playing games before, they really quickly figure, oh, if I'm trying to jump across something, I'm rolling agility. If, if I'm trying to... Uh, you know, see if somebody's in this room, then I'm rolling mine to look through the crowd. Uh, people pretty intuitively figure out how to roll their stats. Mm-hmm. Now, since this is a space opera, let's talk. Let's talk a bit about space combat. I did yes. see that you that you have a ship creation system that is about that is about as in depth as the regular creation system. Um, yes. But when it comes they to space it. combat, um, how do you how do you guys handle it? Because some some people add in their own tweaks. Yeah, um, we did absolutely, and I will. Um, I'm trying to think of if I even want to say this or not because I never ever want to throw shade in another system. Uh, but I'll be honest. So whenever I started making the vessel mechanics for this. I, the only other game that I had deeply looked at the vessel mechanics for was I had bought a module Descent into Avernus for D&D, and that had mechanics for what they called Infernal Machines, and um, I really just did not like how much they left to theater of mind, like uh, how they handled the speed of things, how they handle it, it, a lot of it yeah, was well, just Crawford special. I know, I know yeah. that from a mile away. He's the same guy who put the, who, when it came to item creation, did that whole thing of, Oh, we left it blank so that you guys could come up with it. Okay. You're yeah. Uh, me that you, that you couldn't figure out how to do item creation. Just like you couldn't figure out how to do, how to do a psionic class. So you've made it in a bunch of subclasses, but I digress. So, long story short, uh, the vessel mechanics for combat are different than, they are unique to the vessel mechanics for standard character combat. And if you have mixed, uh, then you divide up the turn orders and carry the uh, sequences out separately. By that I mean your characters will go first, followed by your vessels in combat. Mm -hmm. Um, The way this works for vessels is vessels actually uh, have more of a, um, uh, like, almost like action point system in that every turn you generate power based on your vessel stats, and vessel power is used uh, to primarily do almost anything as a vessel, from using your gear to using your abilities uh, and such. So whereas... Combat for characters is much more akin to like what you would expect a tactical 
a console game like Final Fantasy Tactics or a Fire Emblem to be like. Uh, the vessel combat is much more uh, akin to like action points in Fallout where you might choose to ration and barter for two turns to build up enough to use several items at once. Uh, you may choose to use your points as soon as you get them. Um, essentially, uh, vessel combat yeah, is, is handled more on action economy and currency than your standard characters, which generally only have one action in their standard movement each. Now, you had mentioned earlier about, about skill points. Is skill points tied to this game's version of action economy? Uh, skill points are tied to your level. Uh, it's as simple as whatever your level is, that's the max skill points you have. Um, and no, you, you only use skill points to use your class active abilities. So... Your action economy, as far as other stuff, normally every single character just gets one action uh, and their standard movement on their turn. So whether you're going to use that to block, dodge, make a melee attack, unless you're a class that specifies otherwise, you only have your standard options and your standard uh, one action. Mm -hmm. So skill points are just to activate your class active abilities. So it so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be too far removed from, uh, from say stamina points in something like stamina points in something like Dragon Age or energy in in something like, um, Warcraft. Um, I actually didn't play much Warcraft, but it sounds as though basically it's the same thing. Is it's your currency to to spend to use your abilities that are not standard abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's it's mainly in there for those for those classes and the like that don't use mana. Yeah, so the only the only class that uses quote unquote mana, well mana is energy for us. Uh, and that's the psionic. The psionic whenever they make uh, well actually all characters, whenever you receive psionic attacks and psionics whenever they make them, uh, that costs energy. So basically, they are the only class that actively spends their energy, uh, and all classes actively lose their energy if targeted with psionic attacks. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, now with that in mind, when it comes to advancement, I re I know you guys are doing a class and level based system, but. Do you have advancement as relatively freeform, or, or is it a bit more structured in terms of what you're getting every time you level up? Um, the levels, or the way we do level up uh, is very freeform in the sense that it's by milestone. Uh, we don't have a combat-based thing because we want for all play styles to be equally viable. Uh, so it's really the GM's discretion. We tell them by by missions, by quests, uh, by accomplishments. So you level up by milestone. But as far as what you receive uh, at levels, uh, that is extremely concrete. Uh, let me actually just really quick pull up. I've got it pulled up. Okay, go for it, Spencer. So when you level up, you get to refill all your lost health points, your skill points, and your energy. And then you get three points to spend in any of the eight stats. And then there is a, a little bit of math involved as you reconfigure your specs for your uh, your health, your movement, your inventory, or like your physical range. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are a few features that you can gain at levels three, five, seven, and nine. At level three, you get a damage increase. At five, you're, uh, you get a milestone ability that is uh, generally kind of a passive ability buff of some kind. Uh, and at seven and nine, you gain subclass active and passive abilities. Mm -hmm. Now, when, we, when you talk about subclass, is that akin to a specialization? Uh, yes. So basically the way it works is that by level seven, uh, 
your character, in addition to their primary class, has be like you said, begun to become specialized, uh, and you can add the at level seven passive ability from another class. So, say I'm a, a soldier, and we've been especially tactical and uh, are playing more of an almost like Metal Gear infiltration style thing. And I say, well, now I've become an infiltrator, so I'm going to subclass into spy mm -hmm. uh, for my ability. So, like you said, it, it, it is akin to specialization at high levels. Yeah, and since you mentioned subclassing into spy, it isn't a case where you're adding a whole set of subclasses. It's just that you pick a one of the existing classes to get some of its benefits from. Correct. Uh, yes, that's exactly what we do. And whenever um, character or players are using what we call split organism and multi-class, uh, that's essentially what they're doing as well. We, we lay out the guidelines for uh, how you can customize your own organism uh, or class basically by following a set of rules uh, to split apart the classes based on their abilities, their passive abilities, uh, their buffs and things, so that you can snap together uh, other ones. Like, for instance, if you wanted to make a very James Bond-esque sort of character, you could combine your soldier uh, and your spy. Or if you were wanting to create a, like, uh, oh, warrior psychic or a battle mage, let's call it. You could combine your psionic and your warrior class. I believe uh, I combined a physician and a soldier once where I was a frontline healer. Yeah, exactly. So even though there's uh, eight classes and eight organisms, uh, with the split organism and multi-class, there's the potential to generate thousands of, of unique character builds. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to when it comes to equipment, do you plan on in the full book putting in some putting in some support for um, custom equipment? So as far as custom equipment, no, I don't think I don't think we had any plans uh, of allowing players their custom equipment. But, um, I mean, that's something that I would just personally as a GM say that that's that's a GM thing to do. Any GM is, is welcome to put custom equipment in any game they play if they want to. I'm a big fan of homebrewing. But we don't lay out a format for that. Um, largely, items in the game are defined by what they do, uh, not what they are. Uh, by that, I mean we are not going to go through and have a massive compendium of uh, laser pistol, this gets plus two, this gets uh, this here, then laser rifle, this gets plus three. Uh, what we do is we go by what an item does. Mm -hmm. So you'll have your plus damage weapons, uh, that's melee or range, plus damage, uh, and then augmented weapons and armor, which are weapons and armor that cause or protect from status effects. So if a... Uh, character is using the loot chart and they open a crate and it says, okay, you've got a plus two melee weapon or a plus two ranged weapon and an augmented melee weapon that causes the confused status effects. That's where your GM is going to flavor that. Or you can give the player their autonomy to flavor it uh, by saying, okay, you open this crate and you find uh, a sniper rifle with a, a laser ACOG scope um, and a set of concussion knuckles. Mm -hmm. So uh, rather than have a huge list of different items, uh, we leave that open to flavor uh, and, and allow players to, you know, basically say, I, I have any item that I want to, uh, because one way or the other, the item comes down to what it does on paper. Right. And so one of the benefits for that is, say a character is playing uh, someone that uses natural weapons, then they can even flavor the plus weapon or the status effect weapon as like an evolution that their character has gone through uh, to gain that ability. I'll be right back. One moment. <laughs> uh, now, taking that taking that into account, 
when it, you mentioned a you mentioned a loot table earlier earlier on, um, what prompted the idea of doing a loot table, and how is that going to work within Final Horizons setup? Yes. So you're asking about the loot table. Um, the loot table is basically a way uh, to add a layer of, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, randomness, I guess, uh, to the world and also allow for a character's build to influence the kind of gear they encounter in the game. Uh, the way this works is anytime a character finds something searchable, uh, this can be something like maybe they've KO'd a character and they're searching them. Uh, they just opened a, a locked locker. They found something. Any any instance where the GM might say, okay, it's time for a loot roll. Uh, a character rolls um, a D10 plus their um, tech stat uh, and considers any special abilities they may have. A few of the organisms and uh, classes have abilities that influence their loot rolls. And then uh, based on what they get, they refer to this chart, uh, which breaks down your role for the random items that you encounter. So basically, if, if your character is a techie, you're more experienced and you're more able uh, to find, scout out, salvage, whatever better gear, and you will encounter better gear in the game. Mm -hmm. And I'm, ge I'm guessing that... You mentioned you mentioned that someone's build pl is going to play a factor into the into the loot roll. How does that work? Yeah, th that's just as simple as the higher your tech stat, the higher you're going to average out on the loot roll. Uh, for instance, if you have a ten in tech, which is obviously the, the highest you can get, that would be an, an absolute tech savant. Uh, you're passing ninety percent of your mundane tech rolls against static thresholds. Uh, you're you're basically never going to encounter the very bottom tier uh, items from the loot chart, uh, and only by having ten can can you uh, wind up getting the highest tier items. So it's really just a matter of the more tech stat you have, the more likely you are to encounter better equipment. It's like actually knowing what you're looking at. Exactly. It's it's uh, like I was saying. It's a matter of a character with a higher tech, when looking at the same pile of equipment, would be able to recognize um, more viable equipment than someone who just doesn't understand technology. Someone like me, for instance. <laughs> someone with a low tech stat, like I have. Well, wait. Well, you said it, not me. Just being honest, I'm just millennial enough to be bad at computers. Um, I've learned that age. I've learned that um, age or what or what era somebody grew up grew up in doesn't play as much of a factor as people think. I've seen yeah. I've seen people I've seen people who are tech savvy make really dumb decisions, and I've seen people who are tech ignorant make really smart decisions. Yeah, no, I like I said, I'm 32, so I'm young enough that I should be better at computers than than I am. But I I just am not super savvy at them. Getting my emulators to run correctly on my computer was about the extent of my technical prowess. Well, everybody's got to start somewhere. But what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for both final horizon and the sandbox um add-on so uh that that's a little difficult to estimate i can give a ballpark on that just because uh the beta that you and i are looking at right now for both of them isn't stylized at all and uh I, our formatter, the one that I've hired and we're talking to, I'm, I really like a very stylized, uh, in general appearance. That's something like in the Powered by the Apocalypse games we talked about earlier. I've always appreciated, uh, that their formatting is very 
graphic novelish or comic bookish, and it has more. Uh, that being said, I think there's going to be a lot of auxiliary artwork added to it. Uh, we, we also have exceeded uh, our goal and secured some additional funding outside of Kickstarter. So our illustrator uh, is currently hard at work with several uh, full illustrations and character designs and all sorts of stuff he's going to be adding to it. Uh, I think around 100 pages I, would probably be a safe estimate because right now, uh, just text and tables, it's around 70, uh, 75 pages. And I think arranging all of the artwork and expanding it would probably put us uh, between 100 and 115. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I will certainly be looking forward to see, to seeing how it plays out. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Anytime you guys see fit to return to my temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm a bartender, so I'd be happy to make you a drink, Mildred. Yeah, Mildred, we appreciate you reaching out to us very much. And uh, if you ever do want to see the game in action before uh, its official release every Sunday around this time uh, in our server, we do run live games. So you're welcome to sit in and see. All right. I may keep an eye out on that, though I'm though given my crazy schedule, I cannot make any promises. Hey, that's fair. We're like I said earlier, being a. Uh, an adult in 2022, all our lives are crazy. My life was crazy even before I became an adult. Well, shoot. Well, I, I feel for you for that. I feel like mine didn't get crazy until COVID happened. Uh, we all managed somehow. And a lot, I just have to be the guy who is, who is constant, who is constantly being, t constantly being asked, can you get that thing off the top shelf? And then, I say, uh, and then I say yes, and I continue working. Yeah, and if you, no, know, and if you know if you know the way they worded it, you'll know yeah. where they made the mistake. Would you grab that thing off the top shelf for me, please? I only do it if they say please, and I don't. Yeah. I don't do it, and, uh, and it's only if they say please the first time. If it's the second time, then it's not sincere, so the answer is no. That and I like messing with people's heads because I think every GM is a bit of a sadist, even though even some of them who don't want to admit it. Oh yeah, just blowing, blowing players' minds. Yeah, no, and like I said earlier, I'm a big Call of Cthulhu fan. So if you have that GM sadism, Call of Cthulhu is the perfect game. Rest game. In I am no, I am no stranger to. Pretty much all of the library with um ba with basic role playing, and and is and especially the multitude of of tumults that RuneQuest ended up going through. Okay. Oh, but that's enough. That's a story for another night. Sure. And and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs> <laughs>